So it's the last day. I hope you're all caffeinated up. Um, we're nearly there, nearly done. <laughs> so um, my name is John McInnes. Um, I'm a writer, producer, director, currently making a horror movie entirely in uh, Unreal. And with this production, we're rethinking how a movie is made, distributed, and consumed using the technologies that are available to all of us. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Palmer from AWS and Christopher Burns from Nextera. And we're going to be talking about the next generation of cloud computing tools, um, collaboration tools that AWS and Nextera are developing for filmmakers and creatives like myself. So why movies? It's an it's a, it's a obvious question considering we're making movies um, using game engines rather than games. Well, for most of a decade, I've been asking why not movies. Ten years ago, I was a screenwriter on the path to writing big studio movies. I'd won the Academy Nicole Fellowship, the biggest screenwriting competition in the world, and I was eager to see what studio gig I was going to be writing. The first gig turned out not to be a movie, but a video game called Call of Duty. So working on Call of Duty turned out to be the biggest education I could have had in terms of 3D, immersive, 
photorealistic digital avatars and environments. I was blown away by what we could do in a game engine, and so my question was, why not make movies in game engines? But it turns out gamers were only interested in making games, and movie folks were, well, horrified at the idea of making movies in, with, using video game technology. But not everybody. Zoe Saldana, the star of Star Trek and Avatar, uh, had optioned a couple of my scripts, and she was no stranger to using new technology to making movies. So we threw around a few ideas of what we could make, but Zoe got busy with a couple of small movies like Guardians of the Galaxies and The Avengers. So coming at this, I come at this as a screenwriter, so my primary interest is human characters. So I spent a lot of time making photorealistic, real-time digital humans. This was back in 2016. We were working at Unreal 4.11. We were mostly making virtual reality because virtual reality seemed like the new frontier of storytelling. And I had funded a couple of VR demos that got us a lot of interest. NVIDIA, HTC, AMD all used our VR experiences to demonstrate cutting edge room scale VR with real time photorealistic digital humans. It was these early VR demos and my work on Call of Duty that caught the attention of Harry Shearer. Now you all know Harry Shearer from his work on The Simpsons over the last 30 years, doing half the voices on The Simpsons. So Harry had this idea of doing a weekly political satirical TV show where he would play all of the characters. Photorealistic avatars would enable Harry to play Trump, Obama, or anybody else he wanted to play. And real time would enable the quick turnaround that we would need in order to, for, to do a weekly show. My team made the digital avatars, and I bought the A-team of real time, Cubic Motion, Ninja Theory, with support from Epic Games, and NVIDIA on board. That making of that TV pilot proved what was possible, but it wasn't quite ready for prime time. So why movies? Well, so far, I've talked about how game engines are an important tool in creating content beyond gaming, but movies and 2D linear rendered content in general is equally important in expanding the use and value of game engines. Game engines need movies and non-gaming media to be more than just a tool to make games. Now, we often hear that gaming industry is massive, and if you've made a career in the space, it's easy to think that gaming and gaming culture is everywhere and everything. But it's amazing that there are still huge swathes of the population that know nothing about gaming, and I often hear, particularly from people over 30, that, oh, I'm not a gamer. But everybody watches some kind of 2D linear content, whether that's movies, TV, YouTube, TikTok, whether you're two or 92. The 2D linear video is the original cross-platform, transcultural, transmedia. So it's super low friction with a multitude of ways in which, we can, can, we, in which content is being produced, and there's more of it than ever. So if the future is game engines, then movies and 2D linear media could be more important to that future than gaming. Now, every generation of filmmakers uses the latest technology available to them to express themselves. And in 1995, Lars von Trier held up the Sony VX1000 mini DV camera and with his Dogma 95 manifesto announced it as the future of cinema. Now that statement was a little overblown, but those movies succeeded in shifting our common held ideas about what a movie is. And looking back, those films anticipated YouTube and the explosion of user-generated content a decade later. 12 years after Dogma 95, Paranormal Activity, shot on DV, became the most profitable horror movie of all time. The first in the series was made for $15,000 and went on to make $200 million at the box office. The franchise as a whole has made nearly a billion dollars. The game engines have the potential to revolutionize the way we make movies, how movies are monetized, and how they are consumed. Innovation over the last couple of decades has largely been at the high end of expensive studios, but I believe that the changes taking place now and over the next decade will come from below, from creators like us, forming communities around tools like Unreal that are freely available to all. Companies like AWS and Nextera are building tools to enable workflows for these creative communities. So why now? Well. As we all know, the current model of movie creation and distribution is broken. Success is measured not how great a movie is, but by corporate growth, the number of subscribers to a platform, rather than how engaged an audience was with a movie. Artists and creators also no longer have a stake in their work. 
At the same time, the technology to making great movies are in our hands. Game engines, cloud computing, AI. We are a globally connected community of creators, and we have an abundance of platforms and technologies such as Web3 and blockchain to reach audiences and monetize our work in ways that have never been done before. In an era of churning through streamer pages, something new, something creative is gonna stand out. In a climate of risk aversion, taking creative risks is our competitive edge. And we have the power in our hands to reap the rewards from that. So what if? What if we leaned into the tools in our hands? So what if we leaned into the tools in our hands? Not just supplant legacy technologies, but use these tools to tell stories that can only be told this way. Digital avatars, mocap instead of live action, virtual cameras instead of optical cameras. What if instead of looking over our shoulder and mimicking the movies from the past, we created movies with their own aesthetic that break from the past? Now these were all thoughts that were rattling around my head in 2020. Uh, this all sounds great, but there's a problem. Now nothing gets made without the basic building blocks of our equation, digital characters and environments. Again, remember this is early 2020. Metahumans were still a year away, and the Unreal Marketplace is a fraction of the size it is today. Now at this point, I've been producing content in Unreal for nearly five years, but all of these amazing cutting edge digital characters and environments that we had created had served their purpose and were now sitting on high dri hard drives doing nothing. I'd recently shared some of these precious assets with Mac Werman, and, and uh, to see what he could do with these assets. And as you can see, the results were amazing. Then it dawned on me, well, what if we gave away our precious assets to anybody who wanted to make something with them? So remember what 2020 looked like? Well, we were on full lockdown. All production was completely frozen. Nobody was making anything. Nobody was doing anything. And nobody knew what was going to happen. The only way that we remained connected was through technology. So what better time to launch the Real-Time Shorts Challenge to prove what we as a community could do virtually, remotely, and globally with real-time filmmaking. <clears throat> the idea was simple. We provide some high-level digital assets, and you have 30 days to make a short film. Epic, Faceware, Glassbox all came on board with prizes, and I asked a bunch of my notable friends to be judges. A few weeks after announcing the challenge, we had 180 people from 26 countries all around the world. At the end of the 30-day challenge, we received 30 short films. The challenge proved what we, as a global community, could achieve, not just in terms of what got made, but who made it. Of the top 10 filmmakers, half were women, and the majority of those women were women of color. Funny how if you circumvent the established traditional paths of creation, that other folks can make their presence felt. But the established industry was not ready. I created a movie slate of scripts from the blacklist, Hollywood's hottest unproduced scripts that I thought that we could resurrect with Unreal. But everybody felt that this was too risky to do something unproven. Then last year, I convinced an established director to make his movie for $10 million in Unreal. But greed, ego, and traditional mindsets got the better of them. So if you make things the way you've always made them, you're only going to get what you've already got. And what you get is creative stagnation. Churn, wash, rinse, repeat. An experience that just showed me that this established studio system was not going to be our solution. We'd have to make our movie outside of the system. That turned out to be extremely liberating. But what sort of movie should we make? Now, remember I said that Paranormal Activity was the most profitable, ho profitable horror movie ever? Well, part of its success was because it turned what was perceived as an inferior technology, mini-DV, into its core identity. Horror works because it plays with our perceptions and expectations. We use technology to create images of ourselves and of the world that only over time seem natural and real. Now, no doubt, Tim Sweeney was fully aware of the schism in perception he was opening up when he named his engine Unreal. So if, we create, if we're creating a reality using Unreal, what better way to scare the shit out of people than by setting our movie in a terrifying backrooms virtual simulation? With that in mind, any Unreal environment under the right circumstances can suddenly feel terrifying.
terrifying. <coughs> so our horror movie is comprised of six distinct environments. The poor souls that find themselves in this simulation go from one environment to another. And we can, of course, build amazing environments on Unreal, but we don't really need to build very much because any, everything that we would, might want to use probably lives here on the Unreal Marketplace. So by curating off-the-shelf assets for each of these environments, I was able to launch a new 30-day Unreal challenge to essentially crowdsource this part of production. Modding, kit bashing is a huge part of gaming, so why not approach filmmaking in the same way? Participants picked one of six curated asset packs uh, with a few ba vague descriptions from my script. They created a short film, a mood scene. Brands jumped at the chance to come aboard because the participants were exactly the folks that they were trying to reach. What better way to put the products in the hands of the best people, of the people best able to utilize them? At each step, we aim to create value for everyone. And that then translates into value for our production. And then 30 days later, 30 mood scenes arrived. And the best of these were selected as the backbone of our movie. I didn't have to pitch my story. I didn't have to give anybody a log line. I didn't have to mention the genre or even who was in it. Yet 30 days later, we had the basic layout of our movie for 1,200 bucks of UE Marketplace assets. I created a following from my movie. I created a group of developers with a stake in seeing our movie succeed. The people who participated, even if they didn't win a prize, gained a piece of work for their portfolio that they could be proud of. They challenged themselves, learned something, gained skills and experience. These are the sorts of people that I want to work with. They're passionate, motivated. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. It doesn't matter if you're a seasoned veteran or a noob. Your work can have value and a place in our movie. So this is Connor Buchanan, based in Boston. He was a full-time stay-at-home dad with four children, a wife and a dog when he started with Unreal. And Connor was the overall winner of our real-time movie challenge. This is Alina Benjanaru. This is a mother of five. Now in 2012, Alina left her job as a character technical director with a major animation studios to find greater satisfaction in being a full-time mom. 10 years later, she returned inspired by what she could do with Unreal and was accepted into the Unreal Fellowship. Luke Delamere and Kevin Stewart, they were live action DPs who learned Unreal for our 2020 challenge and ended up winning it. Kevin and Luke have gone on to carve out careers as Unreal cinematographers. And we had developers and teams from all over the world. Tato, led by Peter Bukowski, is a team based in Poland who won their category in the real time movie challenge. So all of our developers, all around the world, and our McKinna Studios regulars, form a mosaic workforce that is fluid, adaptable, and responses to both the needs of our production and the needs of our artists. When we talk about production lines and workflows, this language implies linear progression, stages of production, top-down hierarchies, division of labor, and specialization. I see what we're trying to do is more like cooking. Sometimes we're working from a recipe, sometimes not selecting ingredients, combining ingredients, experimenting, seeing what works with what we have. Now, when I meet an artist or developer for the first time, I always ask, what is it that you want to do? And I try to meet them there. Monetary rewards are important, but money is only one thing we get from work. Work should be as much about discovery as it is about labor. I want to work with people who are curious, who want to explore people who bring themselves to everything that they do. And I want people to take something away from our collaboration. Our collaboration should be a springboard for your creative and personal fulfillment, whatever that is. <coughs> Unreal has enabled us to rethink how we make movies, and now cloud computing is giving us the tools to reshape how we work together. It can free us from time and space, enabling us to have a fluid, dispersed global workforce it enables decentralization and diversity. As a director, I can get a macro and micro view of my movie and see it coming together in real time. It means that I can take more of an iterative approach to constructing my story. As a producer, I can monitor our progress, set realistic goals, manage remote teams, and get a real-time overview of where my production is at, while at the same time building interest and support by inviting investors, studios, and distributors to see exactly what we're making and how. 
I'm now going to turn it over to Chris Burns from Nextera to talk about the infrastructure that they built to make all of this happen. Chris? Thank you, John. Uh, so, in around 2005 or 2006, the game industry started shifting its mentality about games. The, at, speaking at GDC around that time, 05, 06, we pitched the notion that games were rapidly becoming cinematic events. They were movies where the viewer controlled the main character rather than what they were seen as at the time, which were game experiences with cinematic elements sprinkled in for spice. Uh, titles like Bioshock, uh, Fable 2, these are some early adopters of this notion. And they used film and theater techniques for staging and performance, which ultimately led to animators getting actual footage to work from. So now, it seems like we're coming full circle. Movies are now being made with game engines as the core component to the storytelling process. And as a filmmaker, this is a really exciting time. So John set out to kind of explore the boundaries of this new frontier, what could be done. Breaking with tradition and convention, all along the way, he set out to make a movie without much of the typical encumbrance that comes along and bogs the creative process down. I want to talk to you a little bit about the tech that supported that endeavor and a little bit about its evolution and what the future might hold. So John assembled seven teams all around the world. They were, uh, I'm sorry, as a first step in these waters, the, uh, I just lost my track. The, the teams each had uh, local workstations, probably pretty similar to what you guys are working on now. They're running Unreal Engine, they're running Perforce. As a first step into these waters, one of the things that we did is we lifted Helix Core out into the cloud so that John and his team could get an overview of the project as a whole while we maintained individual work streams for each team. It looked a little like this. This is my, my glorious diagram. Um, you know, you can see you've got, you've got your, your workstation sitting out there in your home office, maybe in the production studio. It's connecting over the wire through AD for security and into this, this uh, Helix core server. Now, one thing to notice here is that passage over the wire, it costs, right? It costs for egress, it costs for time, right? So what, what does this look like if you're new? What if you don't have that workstation? What if you're a small studio and can't necessarily outfit machines like that? What if for whatever reason you don't want to install these tools on your local machine? Whatever the reason is, you might move to a cloud-based workstation. So we take that workstation, put it up into the cloud, it's backed by a GPU instance, it's running all the same tooling, and now you're connecting through some VDI protocol. The VDI protocols have become pretty extraordinary and highly responsive to the point where you can use things like substance and get you know, pressure sensitivity and angle and all of the things that you're used to working locally still works in that environment. The nice thing with this, if you notice, that line connecting that cloud-based workstation to Perforce, there's, everything is happening inside of Amazon's network. Data is never transferring over the wire, you're just seeing images of it. So right away, we get a performance and cost benefit because there's no more egress for all that data that you're moving around. I, and one of the other really important things here is this, this significantly hardens our security posture. Right? If data is never moving across the wire and it's completely behind AWS's curtain, you're benefiting from AWS security right away. All right, now, once you're in the cloud, we now have access to a whole new world of possibility. This is a much more robust production environment Let's call it a studio in the cloud, all right? Your workstation is there. You have 
available access to render farms, to shared storage, to AWS backup, just a multitude of other tools. Adding these things in, because this system is modular, things snap in nicely and adding on new technologies becomes very easy. Now this, for those of you that want more details, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is, this is kind of a, a good architectural overview of what happens. If you're not familiar with VDI, you've got your workstation here. It's running one of these protocols. It's gonna connect over into a load balanced uh, uh, VDI gateway, managing your licensing and everything. That gateway will then, uh, you're, you're hitting that via ADA, uh, through uh, Active Directory, AWS Directory Services, let's say. Um, you get routed from that gateway down into another load balanced, or I'm sorry, from the, from the gateway down into a load balanced VDI broker, which ultimately connects you to that workstation in the cloud. That workstation, once you're there, you've got access to all your tools down at the bottom. And if you notice, everything is contained within an availability zone, which means you get high availability. It can be placed someplace close to you, wherever you happen to be. So latency, things like that get optimized out. And now you're really working in kind of a, a studio that you can connect to with pretty much anything that supports that protocol. It could be an iPad, it could be a Chromebook, it could be a laptop or a desktop. So why do you wanna do this? There's a lot of, of great benefits here and a lot of them, in, in doing this work, there's, there's these inherent benefits that we don't necessarily notice and they come along for the ride. So let's, let's talk just really quickly about security. There have been some highly publicized data breaches in the industry that I'm sure you guys have heard of. So once you are within that network perimeter, your data stays secure. You're not moving it around. You don't have the opportunity for interference or, or man in the middle. Any of those, those sorts of things just disappear. Now, you also have full control over this system. So just because you have this intense security model doesn't mean you can't let people in or let things happen. You've got control over this. You're just getting a lot of this for free. You also have the shared responsibility from AWS. So if you are hosting your own data center, if you're hosting your own render farms, any of that stuff, you're worried about your equipment, the physical equipment. That's all secured. Don't need to worry about that either. And then finally, things like, you know, people often ask about what happens if one of my artists who's working in wherever, Vietnam, plugs a, a USB drive into their, uh, their machine and copies my assets. You have control over that too. So you've got a relatively sophisticated model where your information is safe. Everyone is using the same hardware. So Patrick and I were talking, when you've got machines that are running different video cards, different drivers, consistency becomes a thing in your render output. That goes away, right? Because the workstations are all spun up using infrastructure as code, we can automate the creation of them. So you need another one for whatever reason, you hire somebody new, here's a workstation, nice and quick. And lastly, you've got a single point of support. So if, if there's something wrong, a driver needs to be updated, you update it and everybody benefits from it. There's no more running around installing drivers all over a bunch of machines scattered around the office or around town, wherever. The system is modular and that's a key ingredient. All sorts of new technology can be snapped into place. Next year has got solutions for a wide array of tooling that you will commonly use. A lot of it's geared at the gaming industry, but the m and space is starting to use the same tools and we're breaching into uh, more m and &E related tool chains. The decoupled infrastructure, because everything is modular, it allows you to optimize on a very granular level. It allows you to scale on a very granular level. And then finally, it sets you up for integration for new technologies. Right, so anything that can be snapped into there 
with some sort of a wrapper around it that fits into that CITC, that studio in the cloud ecosystem, you suddenly will have access to without having to worry about all the headache and overhead of establishing it. This gives you access to a global talent pool. Right? This is the, kind of the core of what John's working on. You can hire people from anywhere. You don't have to worry about procuring, provisioning, shipping, recovering hardware. The workstations in the cloud let people bring their own machine. They can have the crappiest laptop in the world and it still functions well for them. Fully managed data proximity, right? I wanna put the data close to my workers so latency goes down. And then the really nice thing, and this is, this is kind of an exciting thing to me, having done a lot of onboarding and offboarding of people, it, it, it's one click. I bring on a new resource, they've got their machine, I spin up a workstation for them, they get access to that workstation, and when they're done, I tear the workstation down, goes away and they no longer have access to it. That, that's an exciting proposition to me, especially as it opens up that global talent pool. And then finally, we hit on some things, some performance things. So you have access to high performance machines from anywhere in the world. You wanna go on vacation? You could touch your machine if you wanted to. Now you happen to be lost somewhere? Even if you don't have your computer, you can go into a library and connect if you needed to. The automated and manual scaling allows you to handle a variety of different workloads. Scaling can be fully automated. It can be done all the way down to a completely manual process if you'd like and anything in between. As we talked about earlier, support becomes a lot easier. It's a little change to your infrastructure, your code, and the, any, any support issues can be ironed out from that. Your data is always close by. We've got data transport modules that keep data moving around transparently, so no matter what you're doing, we're always optimizing latency. And then finally, in, within our, our particular system and ecosystem, we have very detailed performance monitoring and cost monitoring, so you can keep an eye on what you're actually spending. Right? You can watch out for machines that are running long or abandoned. All of that is highly visible and easily remediable. Now that modular aspect, there's a lot of cool tools coming down the pipe. And a lot of you guys are gonna to wanna to get your hands on them and play with them. And the thing is, none of you wanna sit down and figure out how the stuff works and how I've got, what I have to do to spin it up, to integrate it into my workflow, to get to a point where I can be creative with it. You wanna sit down at your workstation and be creative. So that modular aspect really paves the way for these things to get rolled into your studio in the cloud, into your cloud-based workstation, so that you can start playing with all the new tech and experiencing this. So Nextera has a version of the same workstation that John's team's been using. You can reach out to me from my, my QR code there if you'd want to take this thing for a spin and check it out. We're, we're standing at the edge of a new frontier right now. There's no roads, there's no signposts, it's all up for grabs. By having a workstation sitting in the cloud like this, you get a seat at the table where the landscape's being mapped. So I urge you, get involved in this. Come sit at the table. Let your voice be heard. Right now, the processes, the methodologies, the best practices, all of that is being defined in this new era of storytelling, and you can have a voice in it. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Patrick here and he's gonna tell you a little bit about laying a virtual art department on top of this infrastructure we just built. So I'm gonna start covering about the uh, virtual art department in the cloud. I'm gonna build on top of what uh, Chris talked about. A little bit about me, I've been working in uh, virtual production, or what is now termed virtual production for about 15 years. Uh, and so here uh, at AWS, I'm focused on the, the creative content and bringing the virtual art department to the cloud. And so what is a virtual art department? This is where creative 
meets execution. This is where your artists work hand in hand with your filmmakers and your virtual production team to, uh, to build these sets in these environments and immerse you in the story. So the virtual production is like a mix of artistry and technology where you have to build these detailed uh, 3D assets and environments that you're going to deploy on the set and use for in-camera VFX. And that's really the key because you're now building these assets that are gonna be 20 feet tall, right? You don't want them to look like a PS3 game. And that's key because what happens is um, you're going to be looking at it with a different eye, right? If you're playing a video game, you're focused on the action, right? You're, you're very uh, accepting of what that environment looks like. But those who are gonna be looking at the, uh, this linear content, the audience members, they're gonna have a very discerning eye and they're gonna notice things and uh, the textures, the colors. If that is a linear movement, like just a tree moving like this, they'll catch it right away. And so the thing is that like, we talk about all the successes, right? Everyone talks about the successes in uh, virtual production, but I'll tell you, the ground is littered with these failures, and that's because you're not giving enough time, effort, to build these assets to the quality that you need to have to put up on that wall. So let's t dive a little bit deeper more into that. So what we're building here is kind of this virtual environment, which is a mechanism for those who are masters of their craft to be able to collaborate together. So those cinematographers, those production designers, uh, those directors, and you know, visual effects supervisors now have this common creative workspace, like a micro metaverse for them to work in. Right? The cinematographers can use this production technology to start doing virtual scouting and start doing blocking. The, like, the directors and the writers can now do script evaluation, right? Start looking for story. And then you're, you want to bring in the visual effects supervisor into this conversation because they do have the discerning eye that can take these computer graphic images and make, and make them look like they are integrated into this world, right? And so the cloud itself really is that an ideal environment. Ah, sorry. So the cloud really is that ideal environment to have a virtual production and this virtual art department because you're gonna have a lot of remote collaboration. You know, to create these assets, you need to find artists who are capable of delivering. And that's hard even in primary markets like London, New York, LA, let alone secondary markets like Sydney and Atlanta. And so how is it that you're going to build this and allow these people to collaborate remotely? Right? You, your cinematographer, when you're starting, they're on a different gig. You want to have them be part of that conversation. And so how do you make that work? And then as we continue this conversation, we talk about visual effects. Right? This industry is taking body blows. Right? And it's more than just the strike. They're, they've been grinding for a long time. And so say like Phil Tippett, right? mad god right, brilliant visual effects supervisor, he has said that like when he worked on Robotron, uh, Robocop, right, it was all about making the shot better. But now it's all about these stakeholders who are like barely engaged, all just trying to find the problem in the shot. And so how is it that you, you know, you're grinding these artists into the ground, just pick, moving all of these pixels to deliver? And so what we're trying to do here is to create that creative space that where all of these people can have these conversations and start working and making these decisions. Because when you turn on that money spigot that is production and, it and it's just crazy amount of money and your weekly for your wall is really high, right? you have to make these decisions about this juxtaposition about when is it that I want to make your decisions as late as possible, but when the earlier you make them, the cheaper it is, right? What you don't want to do is get into the water world situation where it's just this exploding uh, budget, right? And so again, we're, what we're trying to do here is how do we create a creative space for people to work? Okay. So with the John McInnes project, 
right? We have, we're having artists who were working from Vietnam, uh, Japan, North America, all the way to London and Poland, right? How are these people going to collaborate, right? And that review process and the approval is a critical part of that. So the re, you know, for content creation, right, it's this kind of two-stage cyclical process of, you know, continual review and change management, right, all progressing to have a final delivery, right? You know, you're working on these assets in the light and the color, right? And so you're talking to, I've talked to these companies, and what they're doing now is they're flying their artists with a workstation to who are directors who are on remote location. You know, how do you make this as frictionless as possible, right? You really want to make this friction free. Can I just be in my Unreal session and say, hey, I just want to share what I'm working on? You know, and it is about that sharing, but why does it have to be so clunky, right? Again, it's back to how do I make this as friction free as possible? And so, right, like, again, the artists, like, if you have that formal critique and that's fine, but artists want to be able to just share with other artists. Or maybe the soup wants to then uh, share it with a cinematographer who's at a remote location on an iPad. They need that time and space for the exploration. And that's really key, providing time for an exploration so you can make the shots better. Okay. All right, so let's step back a little bit and talk about the AWS global infrastructure. Again, so I said is we have, for the John McInnes project, you have artists from Vietnam to Poland, and that's a, the long way around the, the globe. So how is the AWS global infrastructure going to support this production? So we start off, we have these regions, right? These regions are uh, this, in the physical world, you have a location. It's made up of three or more availability zones. Each availability zone is like one or more data center. Now these regions are isolated uh, from each other, so you can have fault tolerance, reliability, and stability. But what connects all of these is, what's, is the AWS backbone. And that backbone is this uh, fully redundant 100 giggy fiber network that just circles the globe and has this low latency, uh, you know, high throughput, uh, low packet loss, and just a really high quality of network. And on top of that, you have what is called the, uh, the Amazon CloudFront. And this is your content delivery network, right? This is this global network of these points of presence, which are your edge. And from that edge, you can hop onto this fiber backbone and get to your Unreal session in the region. Okay. So we, so we started building this global review project in support of this uh, production. So what are the requirements for having this, uh, a global review system? First off, we're gonna you'd be able to spin up uh, an Unreal session anywhere in the world, right? That artist who knows that they gotta spin up and talk to someone in Germany needs to be able to spin it up in Frankfurt so they can have, that reviewer can have the best low latency experience. Two, simple user interface. These artists, you know, back to the friction-free conversation, how do you get, how do you make it easy? This, like, a two-page, three-page wizard just to spin up the session. Make it really, really easy. Three, you're going to use the pixel streaming that comes built into Unreal. And what that gives you is the advantage that you can work in the browser. It already works on the iPad and Safari, which a lot of these creatives are using when they're remote. We're also, it's integrated with Perforce, and that's really important. So when you're working with virtual uh, production, you never package it, right? There's no cooking and baking process. You're actually running the Unreal Engine editor itself on the stage. So that means that the artists never think about packaging. So they're gonna be working in Perforce. So they upload their stuff to Perforce, and then uh, you just provide your credits, and you pick your stream, and you pick your project, and you, put, and you pick your level, right? Ready to go. Take advantage of the latest GPU hardware. Again, that cinematographer out in the field on their iPad, they want to be able to uh, work and see what it looks like with ray tracing, because you're going to be ray tracing these scenes. And it's not like, you know, like a gaming console platform where you have eight gigs of uh, GPU RAM. You need more than that. And so you'll spin up an instance with 24 gigs. 
And last is uh, single sign-on. You know, your IT wants this, but then the artists also themselves, they just want to be able to use the same credentials that they logged into Perforce to log into this system. Okay, let's dive a little bit more into some details. And here's a screenshot of the detail page. So some of the important notes is that um, once you start streaming this, you're gonna be able to connect uh, to this right from the browser or terminate it, right? And then you could copy the URL and then provide it to the reviewer. And a, a part of this is that you're setting a duration ahead of time. I want to spin this up for eight hours. And what that means is that you know at that point what all your costs are, right? You know that these are the resources I am this, using. This is the instance. This is how long. So you know that it's going to be like a four-hour session. It's going to cost you less than 12 bucks. And then you, you do your review session. You're done. You're two hours in. Terminate it, right? There's no point in keeping these resources uh, and spending the money. And another thing is like, what, you know, what we tackled with this uh, global review project is that you know you're gonna be working with a studio. And so when you're working with their InfoSec security, these are the questions they're gonna ask you, right? Is it encrypted at rest? Is the resource secure by default? And then does it have least privilege access? And that's not just for the user, that's for all of your automated process. Next. Okay. It's Unreal Fest, so we can spend a little time digging into some of the technical details. Uh, people really like it. So the first thing to talk about is this project is being open sourced. It's being open sourced with a very permissive uh, open source license, MIT Zero. It's going to be placed up on GitHub. That means you can take it and then integrate it with whatever production management software solution you have, that, so you know that the review session is over. F-Track, Shockrid, whichever. The second thing is that this is built on what's called serverless technology. That means you use the resources when you use them, and that if you're not using them, they're not spun up and it's not costing you any money, right? There's no 24-7 web server just waiting for input. Like, if you install it now and don't use it for the first month, you're not gonna have any charges. So let's take a look at number one there, the red number one. When you're spinning up your Unreal session in the region, you're gonna spin it up with Windows. Windows is the OS that is deployed on stage, right? And so, um, you know, you get all your, the hardware requirements and all the ray tracing you get with that, as well as that on stage, you, you stay within the lane of uh, virtual production that, that basically Epic tests. You don't go off the road, right? And so that really is Windows. But you can then provide an a starting image, right? What is that machine image that you start with, right? You could start with what Epic provides. They have one in the marketplace and you just agree to their terms of service and use that. Or you can continue to customize it and load it up with all of the plugins that you need. Or maybe you, wanted to, you do have a custom build. It's not common in the virtual, you know, in virtual production. You usually stay with vanilla Unreal because um, you're working with a number of vendors on a, on a stage and there's a lot of hardware involved and you want to stick with what's tested. But you, if you do have a custom version of Unreal, you can load it into that image and make it available or use one that's in the stream if you have it in Perforce. The second, number two over there on the left. So this is CloudFront, again, the content delivery network. You're gonna take, it's gonna take advantage of this in a number of ways. One, uh, you're, it's gonna use a certificate, right? Unreal is generally not have anything secured, so by using that certificate, that means your communication to the system is secured. Your WebSocket communication is gonna be secured, so it acts as that reverse proxy. And uh, as well as that you're now on the backbone to the Unreal session, which you know, gives you a much better experience. And then two is that you're doing authentication on the edge, which is really important because that means you know that when the person is reviewing, they've authenticated and then they're secure. And that Unreal session is actually locked to that CloudFront distribution, not allowing any way to communicate it except through CloudFront. And then again, you're, we're using the uh, Amazon Cognito system, and that's kind of the user authentication. And it has a lot of options like multi-factor authentication, uh, and it also does like federated uh, services. So if, in this case, for us to do this single sign-on, we were using uh, Active Directory. Okay, um, over to number three. 
So when the artist instantiates the session, right, these are the steps that it's going to go through. It's going to start, it's going to reach out to the region, start setting up the network, uh, copy the AMI or this machine image up there, but it's then going to start cop making a copy from Perforce. And what the key part about that is, it's going to copy it without making a workspace. It's just going to take a snapshot, and it's not an ongoing because it's an ephemeral process. So you, now, because you're not creating a workspace, you're not cluttering up the artist experience because they're going to be wondering what are all these workspaces for me. And then it's going to spin up your session and then start scheduling termination for whatever that duration is. And last step, uh, again, whether it's the, uh, the artist in, uh, initial or starts up, uh, the termination or whether you've hit that timeout point, it's going to go through, terminate that session, and then start uh, reaching out to all of the edge and disabling the distribution uh, as well and deleting it. Okay? And that's it for me. So if you want to reach out, uh, here's my contact information. If LinkedIn is your preferred, that's great. Um, I've put up a placeholder page where I've had some of these screenshots as well as the architecture. This is just a placeholder. And what that means is that the link and the content will uh, be replaced when we do open source it. We're right now we're in that closed beta. Uh, after this talk, I'll be downstairs in the AWS booth if you want to, if anyone wants to reach me there. Thanks. Back to John. Well, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I was just in the audience there looking at it and thinking, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so uh, happy that we're making this. It's, uh, it's very, very cool. Um, but as a filmmaker, uh, my only concern, my real concern, is how all of this technology can serve our creative goals. So it all starts here, with the script, with the idea. Well, actually, it all starts out there in the world with the culture, and then it goes in my head, and then it, then it gets up on the, on the, on the page. So. Um, last week, I was at the Academy Museum in Los Angeles looking at script from Citizen Kane. And the format hasn't really changed for nearly a century. And most screenwriting software seems to be stuck sometime in the mid-90s. I use Rider Duet because guess what? It's cloud-based. So once the script is in good shape, uh, I created a Google Sheets document so I can add to the script in ways the screenwriting software doesn't yet accommodate. At the same time, I was shopping for assets in the Unreal Marketplace for our real-time movie challenge. In this instance, when writing the script, I actually was writing the script knowing what assets were available and writing for that. And um, the real-time movie challenge gave us things, but the mood scenes that were created from the real-time movie challenge were essentially self-contained short films. And what we then needed to do was start tailoring those scenes, those scene files, to the specific needs of our narrative. And because we're working with artists all over the world and working on different scenes, I thought it would be helpful to build those environments in SketchUp and storyboard the whole movie to get everybody on the same page. Okay, so next steps. So that's where we're at. You've seen our environments are well in their way to being made. Um, um, and my team are busy building all of our digital characters. I'm keeping all those characters under wraps for now, so maybe save that for the next talk. And we finalized our cast earlier this year. So our next big step is mocap. So we aim to mocap all of our movie, feature film, in six days. Now, we can do that, I and mean, that's realistic because of all the work we put in in preparation up until this point. Now, once we've captured our performances, we will have everything we need to put our movie together. So I've turned this production into a platform for experimentation and innovation. We're working with AWS and exploring a number of technologies that they have in beta, including a, a VPDK photogrammetry module for capturing assets, and NERFs, Gaussian and splats, AI, everything that we can be using this uh, this movie to experiment to see what we can, we can use it for. So I would love to show how we're also leveraging UEFN. There's a big at the talk at the Unreal Fest this year. There's a lot about UEFN, which is and for, for good reason. We're leveraging UE, UEFN for this production. Uh, unfortunately, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but I hope uh, in, the, in the near future we'll be able to talk more about that. 
So I'd like to thank Epic Games for giving me the opportunity to speak here today, for the recognition that the Mega Grant bestowed upon the project, and for all the innovative work that they continue to do. I'd like to thank our tech partners, AWS, and Nextera, and Perforce, and Patrick and Christopher for sharing the stage with me. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, the creative community, for supporting and participating in our little experiment. Your continued support is very much required. We're always looking to expand our tech partners. I'd love to hear from you if you, have, if you think that this production can add value to your product or company. And if you're a passionate developer and you think you can add value to our production and elevate your career through it, we would love to hear from you as well. And if you're an investor, uh, there are a number of ways in which uh, investors can capitalize on our success. Or if you'd like to just like what we're doing and want to support us and follow us, you can now use this QR code to follow us on social media. So this is the first time that we've revealed the title for our movie. And a hit movie, I think, in Unreal would be a game changer for everyone. So from here on out, bad vibes only. Thank you very much. So now I think we have a few minutes for questions. If we still have time, I'm not sure.
Okay? Yeah? So we are going to start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to this talk. Um, this talk won't be a tech talk. It won't be a chill talk, so sit, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to talk about how those little hills were created and all the pipeline and the story about that. So I'm Florian de Gézincourt. I'm CEO and, uh, and creative director of Exaltis Studio, and uh, obviously, I'm French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. So first of all, to get into the industry, um, when I was 27, I was working as graphic artist in uh, the advertising, but I really didn't like that much. And for me, it's really important to have fun in your life and to be happy. So I wanted to get a concept, to be a concept artist. But to be a concept artist, I needed to understand uh, how to get a job, because it was really complex, uh, complicated to get a step in the industry. So what I noticed, uh, two things. So most of the game need a lot of environment, uh, environmental con uh, concept and only few character art. So I had to learn how to do environment concept art to be a concept artist. Also, most of the game are realistic, like most of the AAA are realistic, realistic art style. So if I want to, to get a job, I need to do environment, realistic environment concept art. So, this is what I've done. I follow the train just to get a job in the, uh, in the industry. And it's great because uh, six months after, I got my first job for THQ as freelance artist. So I worked for plenty of clients, like uh, Make Jig the Gathering, um, and did several cards for them. And also, I had the opportunity to work for Dungeons and Dragons, which is amazing because I'm a big fan of uh, role-playing game, and I play D&D since years. So I get one of my first achievements in my career, it was to do one illustration, it's a D&D 5th edition. Then I work also on AAA, so I work on The Division in production, in pre-production also. It was really fun, but like you see, it was completely the trend. It was doing realistic art, destroy, sad story, and yeah, all these are styles we can see in plenty of AAA games. I work, uh, so yeah, it was one second achievement to work on a AAA game. I really wanted to do that, so. I like that. I did work on AAA Studio for AAA game. I also work on two movies as concept artists, a bit on Assassin's Creed and Jurassic World, uh, more. It was fun, but I really prefer to work for, for games. It's way funnier than movies. It's way more relaxed. And, but it's great. I got another achievement. It was to work on movies. And uh, I do also plenty of this kind of image, so this I still Today, I continue to work for Netis as artists. I work for them for, for years, but this is like my comfort zone. This like, I'm in the flow when I do this kind of image. It, it's really fun for me. So um, today, I still do that on my free time, and I continue, uh, I've done plenty of images like this. So destroy, sad image, or like cloudy, maybe because I come from Brittany, it's a part in France where it is raining every day. So, uh, like, after reading Ready Player One, I wanted to do all those, uh, that, but also it's really destroyed and sad. Or the spaceship of Captain Future, like hyper-realistic or so, but again, it's destroyed and it's sad. So it, it all the time, all the time, so it's image like this. Um, and uh, so it was a trend, and uh, yeah, like you understand, uh, I'm an achievement person, so I love to have fun in my career, in my life, and I love to achieve goals. So it was cool. I, was, uh, I worked for d and I worked for AAA, I worked for movies, but then what I could do next, because I did those achievements, but I, I could continue to work on all this stuff. Uh, I work also for music artists or board games, so it's cool, but I wanted something more, like always a new challenge, something new to do. So why not making my own game? So some people do it, so why not me? And if I do a, I, I do a game and it's a success, why not create a video game studio? So that could be cool. And if we have a great team, I can do even bigger games. So let's do for that. I have nothing else to do in my life, so let's do it. 
So to make my video game, uh, I was alone and nobody wanted to join me, so what can I do? I can do realistic games like everyone and uh, like all triple stuff because I know that. I work for plenty of games like this, so it's also my comfort zone, so I could do that. Uh, and also it was 2016, 2017, it was the start of Megascan and it could be really easy and it could be a time saver for me to do that. I can really build environment quickly and make the game working quickly with Unreal, so why not? Uh, but is it really me? I'm an artist, I know how to do, I know how to create. Do I really want to use assets done by others? Or it, maybe I wanted to do like something I'd never done before. I did plenty of realistic art style. Maybe I could do to what I loved at the beginning, which is stylized, uh, stylized art. So I took this challenge to really change what I was doing before to do, to do that. And also, I love playing mobile games. I didn't play on Steam or PC on console because I love mobile games. So I wanted to do a mobile game. But people told me, don't do a mobile game as your first game, this could play stupid. And if you do a mobile game, don't do a free to play game. If you have monetization, it's super complex. And don't do multiplayer also. With server management, it's, you don't have the ability to do it, so don't do it. But if you really want to do a mobile game, use Unity to make it because Unity is really easy for, for indie studio and to, to do a game. And, uh, but I'm very stubborn, and when people tell me that, I do the opposite. So I chose to do a mobile game, free to play multiplayer with <laughs> Unreal Engine. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose Unreal Engine for several reasons. So one of the first is I had a good friend that just started as tech artist in Durham for Epic Games, and he told me this engine is going to make really good things in the future. Like you really, really, you have to believe in it. And yeah, all, we all know now that is really crazy. Uh, so it was at this time, 2017, almost no tutorial for an artist like me. It was some tutorial from Epic Games, but for me as an artist, I really don't, don't understand those tutorials. So I was happy to have him. It was like my evangelist for me. So help me for, to look for documentation and, and to answer to all my questions. Also, it was Blueprints. I'm an artist, so it's perfect, like coding. I really don't like coding. I have a computer science degree, but it was just to please my mom. And uh, <laughs> Blueprint is cool for an artist because you can do beautiful nodal system, and it looks great for nodal. It's not, maybe not working, but it's beautiful. And the render quality of Unreal, uh, we all agree with that. It's really amazing, and I love art, so for me, it was a good reason. I just don't want to make a game. I want to make a studio as well. As well. And Epic Games are great for indie studio, and I still believe that we continue the future for, for that. And so that was a good choice for me. So when I started, it was uh, 4.19, so a long time ago, like, can, can I, say, I can say that. And um, almost nothing on mobile, and uh, maybe I was stupid to do that, but maybe not, I'm here today. I want to share something because I think you all had that once in your life. It's, it was my bad cave. It was the, the basement of my apartment that I was spending days and nights there. I, I think maybe plenty of you, you, you had this kind of story. Uh, no windows light and just working every day, every night. I had no kids at this time, so it was easy to do that. Uh, but it was really fun. So in my bad cave, I start to draw a lot, doing many sketches to understand what exactly I want to do. I want to do for mobile, so it's really small screen resolution. I want the art to be really clear and visible. So I drew this kind of image, and okay, it was some idea. I drew plenty of images. But uh, something I heard, like players like to recognize themselves, so, and they need, they need a face visible. But the problem I have, and oh, I'm not a character artist, but more environment artist, because I have the same disorder of, as Brad Pitt, is I'm face blindness, which means, which means it's really hard for me to recognize people. For me, you all look the same. So 
ask him to try because maybe it's what the player wanted, like to have uh, faces, he can customize character, he can change hair, we can have gender with that, we can switch part, and also I can animate that myself with Paper 2D. Uh, I can do everything myself. But 2D, uh, in my opinion, is too much a niche market on mobile, so I'm, I wanted to explore more. So I tried to do 3D character. I never done 3D character before doing that, uh, and it was my first try, uh, try but it was fun. Like, like I told you, I love to learn all the time new things and to challenge myself. So I tried with this little character. Uh, I tried some mechanics to about switching gears, customization, and it can work. So I'm okay with that. I have kind of a design. It's, it's that. And, but now I need to know, I am an artist. Do I am able to create, to develop, and to make my own game? So. This is a result I got after eight months of working with Unreal, the first opening of NG, uh, Unreal Engine in my life, and after eight months. I wasn't only doing that every day because I had a side job. I was also working as a freelance artist for, for doing spaceship or other clients. So that it was only on my free time. And I was quite happy because I get uh, game design. Uh, it's very ugly, I know, but it was a prototype like to, to see what can I do. So with leaderboard, uh, save game, player customization, you can switch parts and you can add colors and switch weapons. So I had like the first prototype working kinda uh, on Unreal Engine. And I was super proud of that. And uh, for, for me, it was a big achievement because it took me for the first drawing to this, it took me like one year as on, uh, on working on my free time. So I was super happy. I had that. Uh, I need now, it's time to show to my friends because I need to see the reaction of people. So I was super happy, super excited. Like, you have something, you build, you put a lot of emotion in it. And uh, you, I was sure like my friend will love it. So that was the reaction of my friends. <laughs> so the game had no fun emotions. It was very basic and classic design, basic animation, basic design. And I was almost going into the uncanny valley. And that wasn't really good. And one night, during a party with some friends, uh, a, a friend came to me, he was quite drunk. And he told me, oh, come on, you, you have to stop what you are doing. All your, all your dream, all your game is sucks, really sucks. So sorry for my French. And he told me, remember your first drawing, like they were way better because now what, where you are going is not right. So for me, hearing that, I, I test over 35 percent and they all over, were the same, like it wasn't bad. So it was half of my ego because I'm good in my career, I know how to do, I work for plenty of clients, I'm conservative art director, and I cannot create something interesting for me, for my own game. So that was hard after one year. But I never give up, and never give up. So as I remember what my drunk friend was saying, he just went, go back to the, beginning, uh, to the beginning. So that was really my first drawing of, uh, of the game, and in fact, it was the first idea was a good one because it was efficient. So I worked more on this idea and I wanted a 3D game, so I did 3D modeling of my heroes. A bit of concept art, I also test um, my game design if it can work, like switching helmet, switching uh, shoulder part, switching body, and in fact, everything can work with these little heroes. So why not? But I'm not a character artist and I need someone that is good to make my idea way better. So I asked a friend, uh, which uh, Miha Bozel is um, a freelance character artist and with a lot of experience, and I asked him and gave him my concept and told him to, to do something better. So he worked on it and he, has, he really loved details and spending time in the perfect shape. Like I remember when he was working on the belly of the hero, it took like several days to find like the perfect shape of the, of the belly. But because of 
his eyes of details and all, all the love he put in, in that, we got those heroes and I'm super happy of what he have done. Today, Miha is also associate of the studio and a tech artist and lead artist of the studio. But now I have those little heroes. Before, with my human Uncanny Valley heroes, um, I, I could animate them with Mixamo. I have uh, auto rig with Mixamo, animation with Mixamo, everything. But I tried Mixamo on those and it was completely broken because those heroes have no knees, have almost no legs. It's like one tenth percent, uh, ten percent of the world character. So I had to have a new rig. So. I hired, uh, found a good company in Czech Republic, and they were working on big, big project. But I told my story, I showed them the concept, and also uh, an animator friend helped me to talk to them and to really find the good rig for, for the heroes. Because they have a particular design and they are fun and comic, so we need something very particular with uh, with stretch on squash and editable constraint, distortion, and they did an amazing job with, with, this, with it, and we are continuing to work with them. So from that, now I have those heroes. I also need animation, like proper animation. So my friends, um, uh, Bozovic, Thomas Bozovic, and uh, work uh, on those animation and did 15 animation for my first game. I'm going to talk more about animation later, but for long story short, I, I got the first game in 2019 with 16 animation and all the prototype I'm going to show. And something to know, so in 2019, my wife and I uh, had our first baby, so it was everything together. But I did uh, the first game in 2019, so I was super happy. It was on the market and it worked quite well. It was a success, plenty of players were playing it, and I had customization and players, they can fight, it was auto fight, fighting game. And also, I love playing it, so that was really my goal, like to love playing what I'm doing. Uh, and players were, were super, super happy. So it was great. Uh, in 2019, first game, some people joined also the adventure, and with them, we created uh, Video Game Studio in 2020. And at this time, it was COVID. So for me, as freelance artist, from 2010, I was from 10 years, I was working in my bad cave or basement, always in my place. And then COVID start, we moved to an office with a team. So that was a bit stupid, but I, we always do what others don't do always the opposite. So, super happy, we have a team, we created a, stu a studio, and with them we created a new game in 2021. And also in 2021, my, uh, my wife and I had our second baby. So, everything, like I love, I love the challenge. <laughs> so, we did a better game, better everything. Uh, better visuals, better combat, better animation. This game have, uh, had uh, 120 animations. So we wanted something that really looks good. And we have all the monetization stuff, seasons, skins, all the blah, blah, blah you can find in uh, mobile games today. But the thing, this game wasn't a success. It didn't work as well as we expected. And what can we do after that? We have a great team and they work for experience on mobile, which is super hard when this, you start your career and you start on mobile. It's a lot of constraints, uh, you, you, there's a lot of validation, certification, uh, optimization to make it work on mobile. And so it was multiplayer support. Uh, it was multiplayer and you had to do the support and to answer to player, and the player data management on everything. And also always looking on KPI, analytics. And it was all the, time, all the time that, looking for D1 retention, D7 retention. And we almost forget what was the fun to do games because it was just marketing, analytics. And this is not what we wanted. But it was a great challenge for the team. The thing is, we didn't have so much money. I'm lucky because one of the associates is really great to find money. And in France, we have a lot of subvention, tax reduction, tax credits on everything. So he found money for the studio. And with that, we could continue to make other games and bigger games. But to do new games, so we had to analyze what is also happening on the market. 
So all the way five, we are all here for that. It's unbelievable, it's crazy, it's beautiful. Also nanite, mega scan, and what we see with Lumen and everything is just amazing. Uh, so we have Unreal 5 coming and working on it now, uh, and it makes everything more accessible, which means now you can make a game without knowing almost no modeling, without knowing animation, without knowing uh, almost programming, because you can find everything on the market, and uh, you can make a game with everything already available. PC and consoles are getting really, really powerful, and they like, uh, players love to have the best FPS, uh, no, the best, oh, sorry. He has the best computer and best performance, and also now with uh, Snapdragon, it's the same on mobile. You have ray tracing on mobile coming, and that is just crazy. Uh, all game, plenty of games are have a hyper realistic. There's level of details, which is amazing when, when you play with it and when you go in a forest full of foliage and details. It's really amazing. And like I said, like it's getting more and more accessible. So anybody now can create a, a game with all assets, with everything included, and ev anyone now can create a game. So it's it's really crazy. But with all this tech. How can we benefit that? How can we use all this tech for us? We have our own IP, and how can we make something really amazing with all this tech? So, Lumen, for example. So, um, oh, so yeah, it's Lumen. Uh, this is what I love in my job. I love doing this kind of stuff, so that was done just for, for, for the fest, just a, a quick demo. Uh, I love doing concept art, I love building world, I love building lighting, mood, creating emotions. And with Lumen, you can directly apply lighting, apply story, and change everything like you want. And that is so fun for someone like me. I'm like a kid playing with his Lego, and um, I can do whatever I want, and change the lighting. And what is even more cool, that I can play with, I can play it, so that is really, really cool. For Lumen, it's great. Uh, I don't know if we are going to use it or not, we, but it's fun to play it. Uh, the thing is, when you are stylus game, uh, Lumen is cool for us as developers because we can, oh, see, it's, not, it's a new other character now, now have bounce lighting, global animation is perfect, but does uh, the player really need it? That we don't know, so we will see. Um, we, lo we use also modeling tool a lot. Uh, there was some conference about that. It's a really powerful tool, and we can iterate very quickly with it. We can create levels, we can modify, create assets, and uh, unfold UV. It's really, really cool to go very quick in production. And um, so uh, with modeling tool, uh, the video is quite long. But uh, you, you can see like uh, that it was done like uh, in real time, uh, I forget, but like 40 minutes or something. And we can just build and have fun and change and modify uh, all assets. So we have, we're still using three software, but with modeling tools, there's less back and forth with software. So the, the artist, a 3D artist created some assets uh, with, uh, with a Swiss software, and then import it in uh, Unreal, and we can really manage and move them and also edit them and merge them to make like a new object. So with that, it's really cool because we can change texture, we can modify the asset, we can do whatever we want with a new static mesh. So um, I, I'm late in the video, it's quite long. Also, yeah. It's cool to delete and to change uh, faces, texture, and to distort it like, like we want for the level. Now I'll let it at the end because it's interesting what the artist is doing. It's really efficient because we can really iterate quickly and to make whatever we want with all assets. And that is really cool. It saves a lot of time, it's really optimized, so it's a really great tool. Also for material, 
so artists make materials, it's not uh, the programmers that make materials, so no that system is perfect, and here we see the artist uh, creating one shader with three uh, set of texture going in uh, RGB channels. So with that, it's cool because with one shader, we can create material instance and paint on uh, any assets, and we can really tweak them, change them, and with a mask, we can make them blend like we want. So with one shader, uh, we have several materials and instance using the same set of texture. So that is really optimized, which is great for if we want to be on mobile or if we want to go for PlayStation 4, it's super great. So for example, here a quick test that was done for Unreal Fest also. Uh, all this test was done from scratch, like really from scratch asset creation to this result, it was done in two or three days. Which is really cool with that is um, there's only two materials in it and, uh, and we can really paint what we want on all the environment and it's already optimized like we want. So of course, like it's using lumen and reflection on everything, so that won't work on switch or mobile, uh, but it's really, we are testing stuff, we are just having fun. So just a work of two, three days, we can iterate and make toss of our environment very quickly, and it's okay we don't keep it, we just make new one, and from scratch to this result is super fun. So because we are stylized, we can also have our game on tablet, on mobile, and on PS5, and if we don't use Lunet, Lumen, it will be perfect, because we don't use Nanite. Uh, for me, for the game we want to create, there is no point to use Nanite, and we are, uh, for Lumen, we are not low poly, we are not high poly, so Lumen is working, uh, but it's really great to see it on tablet. It's great to see it working on mobile, and on PlayStation 5 also is great. So why using Lumen? I don't know. It, the, what, it, the most important thing is, is Lumen is adding fun or not to the experience? So that we will decide with time. Yeah, I cannot talk about stylized game if I'm not talking about animation, because to me, stylized, half of the stylized is, so visuals, of course, with the design of the heroes, but also uh, animation. So here it's a, a render in Unreal Engine and uh, with in-game asset. So that was done uh, for, for marketing and uh, it works super well. It's super quick to do and it's really, really fun. And the animator, so now I'm going to talk about animation. Thomas Bozovic did that. He, it was a big challenge for him to give life, to give expression to, to the hero because they don't have any face. They don't have, we cannot see any emotions. So he has to give emotions by rhythm, by posing, by acting, and to really to give personality to the heroes. And with the same rig, we have tons of heroes, and, um, but we need to add personality to them. To make some differentiation, there is, of course, art style, there is visuals, but also animation can, can give attitude, can give emotion to the player, and that it really is really good at that. When a new animator comes to the studio, it's a big challenge for, for them because when you see no legs and um, the, the character proportions, they, they cannot do that, like they, they are like this, they are blocked. So it's a real challenge for them, but six, the, the animator really succeed to make something really fun. 
So they import the animation uh, as FBX, and then we can really manage them uh, like we want. And it's super easy tool with Unreal to, to change, to create combo, to add uh, SFX, to add um, VFX. It's really, really easy to, to manipulate. We can also uh, work on locomotion, and, uh, and it's really, really easy to manipulate and be intuitive, so that is really nice. Uh, last point I want to talk about, so, so this is more my comfort zone, is uh, using Unreal to make marketing assets. And it's really powerful because I don't need to wait for render time with any 3 software. I have all my assets, all my materials, and I can really put all the lighting I want. So I'm cheating a lot on the lighting. Uh, but it doesn't matter because what I'm looking for is a final image. I know it's going to be a still image, and I'm going to paint over because I'm, I will be quicker to paint over an image to have the final result like I want than spending time in Unreal. But I'm having a lot of fun creating those kind of image, giving life and putting like fun stuff happening on screen. So for marketing, uh, also we are doing the marketing because we put so much love and emotion in, our, in, in the little hero that we want to do ourselves. Like we believe we have the best person to make the marketing asset and to make life to the heroes. So now, this, the full team, so we are really a small studio. We are 13 person approximately, and uh, like I'm really, really proud of each person in this team. And uh, like every morning when they wake up, they just kind of wait to go to work. And that for me is a big achievement as a CEO. Like everyone is happy, I want them to be super happy because I really believe if they are happy, they are going to great to be to make an am amazing job. So I really take care of them. It's like my second family. I really take care of them and I make everything possible that they, they will do the best and they will be happy to, to be at Exalty Studio. So now, uh, so we are a small team, but we have to, smart, to work very smart because uh, we cannot challenge, compete with like bigger company. Uh, we don't have the money to compete with that. So we have to think, can we do that or not? Is it adding fun for the player or not? Uh, how much time is going to, to, to take? If it's not great, okay, we cut. It doesn't matter. The player, we never know that we cut that or that. So we just, we need a final product and we need to be really smart on how we are going to make it. And today, it's not just my game. It's not my creation anymore. Now, it's a whole team game. Every person in the studio can give any idea, can put his, his soul in the, his or her, because we also have girls, of course, and uh, the soul uh, in, the studio, in the game and all ideas and uh, like, I don't run the company on, 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 at saying that I'm the boss, you do what I want. Like, no, I need them because I really believe that all together we are doing a greater game than if I was alone. So that are, it's really important for me that everyone can really put something into the game and they put love in the game. And yeah, we are all here for that. We are using an awesome tech. It's super crazy, and it's amazing to use it, so that I cannot say more about that. A last thing is a friend of me like to call the Unreal, uh, Unreal Apocalypse. Uh, he he means by that, and I agree also, it's plenty of games are going to be released um, with hyper-realistic style, uh, with plenty of assets created by other people, and we are going to see more and more that on the market because Unreal is becoming really more accessible and anyone can create a game. It's way easier to create a game today than before. So if everyone can create a game, we, the market will be pl with plenty of games and people, we, we start to, gamers will start to consume game. They will take one game, they will play it, they will eat it like a candy, and then we take the second candy and eat it, and they will forget about the previous one. But that, we really have to be careful of that, 
because when we make games, we, everyone put love in it, and if player forgets the game, it, it's really hard for us, for all the effort uh, we, we have invested in it. So our goal is always to make a game that player will never forget. Sorry. And one last thing, now, I just did a new achievement in my life, so to do a talk in this event. Thank you very much. I want to take the time to take also a selfie with all of you. Uh, that. You can smile or do something. <laughs> Ask any questions. Also, if you have any tech question, I'm not really the good person to, to answer to that, but I came with my two devs and they will be more than happy to, to answer to your questions. So if you have any questions, come to the mic. Hello. Great presentation, by the way.
Are we good? All right, cool. All right, cool. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, like I was just saying, it's the best part of the uh, UE Fest. I hope you all had a great UE Fest. Uh, but you know, it's the end of UE Fest, last talk of the day, post lunch. Can't be more perfect. So, welcome to my talk, all of you. Um, uh, Unreal Engine for Fortnite, or UEFN, has been uh, a very exciting tool. Uh, creators from all over the world uh, are creating uh, amazing experiences in UEFN uh, because they have the ability now to import uh, your own assets uh, into UEFN and you're able to create a, an experience where the look and feel is completely unique to what you, you want it to be. Which also enables a lot of folks to, del to then tell your own local and regional stories uh, using UEFN. So this talk is about such creators and also for creators aspiring to do that. Uh, while there are technical aspects to this talk, uh, this talk is, I would say, more about planting an idea, planting an inspiration, and I hope that you find that inspiration you take home with you when you create your own UEFN experiences. So who am I? Uh, I am Arvind Nilakantan. Uh, I am the technical account manager for Epic Games based out of Chennai in India. Uh, it's a fairly big town uh, in India, uh, beach town, second largest beach. Uh, and I primarily work uh, with studios based out of South Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa. Simply put, my job is really to connect people who have technical questions uh, with people who if I'm unable to answer those technical questions, I'll then connect them to people who have expertise uh, in that particular uh, question that, they are, that they're asking. So I'm constantly talking to developers, I'm constantly looking for feedback, and with that feedback, I go back to the engine developers, and so that, that's how we inform the Unreal Engine and UEFN roadmap. Uh, and if you wanna get in touch with me, uh, you can follow me on those handles or drop me a, an email. So with that, let's look at the agenda of my talk today. Uh, first, I will talk about the inspiration behind this talk. Second, I'll share some technical tips on how you can bring some simple photogrammetry-based assets into UEFN. Third, I'll propose a thesis based on the conversations that I've had with a lot of studios already using UEFN on what makes an ideal team composition when you're building a UEFN experience. Uh, four, on an existing UEFN uh, experience that's already live, uh, I'll do like a quick case study on their findings. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll get back to inspiration uh, of the talk and seed some ideas for this. So, sounds good? Yes? All right. If you're saying thumbs up, I can't see it. So, I'll assume you're all saying thumbs up. All right. Let's start with the inspiration. Whoever brings on a billion users First, would be the presumed leader in setting the standards is what Tim, Sini, Tim Sweeney has said. Uh, and today we have about 500 million players on Fortnite, and we are on road to add another 500 million players um, in, in Fortnite and in the platform. And it's not, in fact, just about the players, right? It's, in fact, more about the creators, because you need to add more creators in order for more people and more players to come and, uh, and play these UEFN experiences, which are importantly more relevant uh, to the audience and to, to the players themselves. So that got me thinking, um, you know, where can we find another 500 million uh, plus players and creators, right? So got any clue? Yeah. Uh, looks like uh, that place. Looks like that yellow part of this very helpful world population history website uh, shows the most number of people based on just location. And as luck will have it, I am the technical account manager for all those places. Uh, and that's very exciting. Also, I'm from India. We are number one in many things, including having the, the, the most number of young population in the world. Uh, so it's a, it's a very exciting time for me personally. And the, the cool thing about these areas is not just about me getting excited about it, but these areas have been, have been around, uh, the, the cultures have been around for thousands of years. They've already done the world building for us. Uh, so I think it's a good opportunity for us to maybe leverage on that world building and the storytelling, which then, which, which is what is also exciting for me as part of my job too, which is, I'm also constantly traveling and meeting all of these, uh, you know, getting to know all of these cultures, meeting new studios, uh, and meeting new people. And photogrammetry has now become my new hobby. 
Uh, whenever I find time, I find scanning interesting looking assets using the Reality Scan app. And until a few years ago, um, or unlike a few years ago, uh, photogrammetry has never been more accessible uh, in, you know, in the history of photogrammetry, I would say. All you really need is a phone. But it's really no fun if you just have the 3D asset, you know, a few years ago when AR became, a, there was a hype in AR, you had a nice dragon in your hand, uh, and it was exciting, but then what? Like, what's the point of it? Like, you know, but you had to make a good use of it to, in order for it to get exciting, which is why when UEFN got announced, uh, it got me, along with many other developers around the world, quite excited. So here is what I did. Uh, so before I play this video, I want to I want to preface that I am not a lighting artist. I'm a programmer. Uh, so don't judge that environment uh, for for its uh, artistic ability because I literally just cobbled together assets that I had scanned. I dropped them inside UEFN. And during the technical part of this talk, I will show you how to build an environment probably better than uh, I, I, I can, uh, which you can do. Uh, and also, just note, in the technical part, I will not actually be walking you through how to use the Reality Scan app, because it's already done in a previous talk. I'll just show you how to use or consume the, uh, the, uh, the Reality Scan scanned asset into UEFN. So here it is. So this is, a, this is a environment I put together. Uh, in this level, uh, you are barred from entering the inner sanctum of this place uh, unless you destroy this custom prop, which is also another scanned asset. Uh, and in this talk, I'll show you how to recreate this level, uh, and I'll walk you through the process of importing uh, the scanned assets, uh, cleaning those assets, converting them into props, and then working with some very simple inbuilt uh, Fortnite devices, and I'll, if you're unfamiliar with Fortnite devices, I'll also tell you what that means. Cool? That looks cool. Again, don't judge me by my lighting, but it looks cool. So the assets you just saw is actually a combination of scanned assets from India, from Abu Dhabi, from Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. It's awesome, like it's like I'm bringing the world together. Uh, and they also contain a few inbuilt assets uh, from Fortnite, uh, and also some Quixel assets. So, Let's talk about how to work with them. Now, before I begin, uh, I also want to I want to say this is not a new idea. Uh, there has been studios around the world uh, who have already started building works that have a local flavor to it. So I want to pay. I, I want to just highlight a few of those studios before I actually start my technical part of the the, the talk. So first off, this is Prop VR. Sundar is here. Hey, Sundar. Uh, they are a studio based in Canada, uh, Middle East, and India. Uh, they are experts in building digital twin-based applications. Now, what they realized was that they can also reach to the next generation of audience by dropping the same digital twin city inside Fortnite. Uh, they recreated a part of Dubai in Fortnite, and they added some very cool gameplay elements in it. You, you can like literally fly through Dubai uh, as your Fortnite character, which I think is amazing. Next up, this is an example from Masala Games. Uh, they are an Indian game and animation studio. Uh, their mission is to produce content and games which reflects modern India, not just like the you know, typical ancient India. So here we are seeing a lot of samosas, tablas, carts, auto rickshaws, which are all just custom-made assets that were imported into Fortnite using UEFN. Uh, this game, of course, is still work in progress, and the folks uh, from Masala Games were actually very kind to have given me a preview of what they are working on. And finally, the third and the final example I want to show you is from UGC 90. Uh, they are also here, hey. Uh, they are a Turkish studio who have published quite a number of UEF in uh, islands, and this particular example is interesting because they Im imagine pop culture uh, in their design, which is pretty cool. Uh, and that said, I do want to caveat that, you know, when you publish your island in UEF and make sure you have the rights for those assets, so it's quite important. So let's begin. What are some neat ways to add local flavor to your island? Now, obviously, custom making assets using Maya or Blender is the most obvious one, and this is something I won't talk about because there is another cooler way, and that is through using the Reality Scan app on your phone this now works both on iOS and Android, which especially is, is interesting on the India, Middle East, and African market because majority of uh, the users over there are using Android. So when you scan an asset, the processing happens on 
the reality scan servers, and the finished model is uploaded to Sketchfab. Uh, and this, well, by the way, was this 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 wall, by the way, was scanned in Riyadh in a, in, in Saudi Arabia, and this is what you see. Now, Sketchfab, by the way, is also part of the Epic Games ecosystem, so you're, you don't have to get out of the Epic Games ecosystem to do any of these things. Uh, so it's like, a, if you're unfamiliar with it, it is, it is a place where you can upload your 3D models, and it also has a library of 3D models that you can download from. So you can then download the asset by scrolling down and clicking on the download 3D model link. And when you click that, you're then able to download the asset in a number of formats. I'm a, format, I'm a fan of GLTF, uh, so I'm just going to download it as a GLTF. Uh, so I'm just going to click on that. So once it's downloaded, you can open up UEFN to then import the model. And from the content browser, I'm just clicking on import. Uh, in the in import options menu, I'm just going to leave the import options to its default parameters. So let's see what happens. Click on import. Takes a bit of time to import. Uh, but once it's imported, imported, there is a problem. And this is something that you would typically see. The problem is the model seems to be all scattered. In fact, if I open one of these assets, I can only see part of the wall. And this is something that you probably see in photogrammetry and UEF in quite a bit. Now, why is that? The quick for that is quite simple. Uh, first, let me just delete all of these assets. I'll re-import them again. And this time, I'm going to scroll down and select this option which says combine static meshes. And as the name suggests, it'll combine all the assets together. Uh, let me just open up the content browser again. And this time, instead of a dozen or so scattered assets, uh, there is just one wall. Let me open it up. Just one static mesh. So the takeaway here is typically when you're importing, you might see this uh, when you're doing photogrammetry or when you're importing photogrammetry-based assets, but you know it's a very simple fix. You don't need to get out of uh, the engine to fix this at all. The other problem that you'll typically encounter is having unwanted meshes and artifacts. Now, this is a statue I had at home. Uh, and when I scanned that statue, I had the statue, um, you know, on a stool. Well, it's like, you know, there's a stool under it. Uh, and the reality scan app also captured the stool, and I don't really care about that. So how do I remove that? I can, of course, go to Blender or Maya and then uh, and, and remove it over there, but that's cumbersome. There is a much simpler way to remove these unwanted parts of your model uh, when you're bringing it through photogrammetry using UEFN's modeling tools. How does that work? Go to the top left corner. I'm going to select modeling tools, which will open up a new window showing all the modeling options in UEFN. And there are a number of options in there. Uh, and you know you could, you could literally explore quite a lot. But my favorite one is something called the planar cut. So I'm going to select that planar cut. And planar cut does something very simple. All polygons, which is behind the selected plane, gets removed. That's it. And I'm going to move the plane up and down just to make sure that I get the foot of the statue. And instantly, the stool part of the model got deleted. I'm going to adjust it. I click on accept, and I'm done, which is pretty cool. You don't, again, have to get out of the, the, the model at all. Now, when you're, another problem that you'll typically see um, is uh, when you're working in teams. This is going to loop for a bit. Uh, but the idea is when you're working with teams and you're importing your custom asset inside UEFN, your teammates will see a giant red box, and they will not, in fact, see the asset. Uh, and this is a very typical problem. Uh, and this, and by the way, this wall that you're seeing, not the red box, but the wall that you're seeing was scanned uh, in the northeast of India uh, in a, in, on the streets uh, using the Reality Scan app. So the fix for that is also quite simple. Uh, just click the button called Push Changes, uh, and this will upload the imported assets into the Fortnite servers so that everyone in your team can then start seeing and working collaboratively with each other on that front. Cool. All right. So there you go. So there, now the wall is in there. Your team members can also see the imported asset from the Fortnite servers, and it's now ready for showtime. But you'll see a problem right here, too. Problem is, it's really no fun if that asset is just lying around and it's being all non-interactive. Uh, and so in order to make your imported asset into an interactive prop, as we call it, 
uh, so that you know the players can then damage it, for example, and, and you know um, maybe this slips coins just coming out of it when you destroy it. You need to make your asset that you have imported into what is called a building prop blueprint. Now you can you can make it into a building prop blueprint by building prop blueprint by right clicking on the content browser. You can select the the uh, blueprint class called building prop. And here I'm going to name it BP underscore Assam wall. That's the northeast, northeastern state in India. And in the blueprint with just the parent actor selected, I'm just going to drag the wall static mesh into the static mesh part of the details panel. And boom, that's it. Now, now my asset is a, my wall is now a building prop. I drag this building prop blueprint into my world and I clicked on play. Well, Nothing really happened. It's exactly the same, right? It's exactly, I'm trying to interact with it. Nothing happens. So why is that? That's because in UEFN and in Fortnite Creative in general, there is a concept called devices. Now devices are, I'll say, modularly self-contained logic with which you're, I mean, they can talk to each other, but they only do one very specific thing. And there are a number of uh, devices within Fortnite, like you know, like a sequencer device, which does only sequencer. There is a teleportation device that takes you from one place to another. Uh, and in, in, in our case, one such device that we'll be using is something called the prop manipulator device. And you can see that, you can find them in the Fortnite folder. So I'm going to drag the prop manipulator device into the level, and I need to make sure that the device is overlapping with my building prop blueprint. And with the prop manipulator selected, I can then go to the details panel and define properties such as the health of the prop. Like in this case, I'm going to set the health of the prop to be about, I'll say, 500. Uh, so that's and and um, and you know now, let's see what happens. And now that I have set that prop, that prop will not be visible inside the game, but the wall is now interactive. I can now destroy the wall, and now I can interact with the wall. And you can also add like custom destruction effects, like let's say you destroy a wall and ghost flies out of it or something like that using the Niagara particle system. Uh, you could totally do that. Uh, so, but now you have something useful to do with the, with the props that you have imported. So using these exact same techniques, uh, this is how I put together this creepy looking environment, but badly lit environment uh, inside UEFN. Uh, this scene contains not just my own custom assets, but also default assets uh, from Fortnite, some Quixel assets, uh, the party lights that you saw at the beginning uh, were actually from Quixel, and the floor uh, on the, like the party lights and the purple ones are all from Quix, uh, from uh, Fortnite, and the floor itself is from, um, uh, is also from Fortnite, whereas the ceiling of this, of this environment is inside, uh, is, is done using Quixel assets. So you, like mix and matching, doing some cool stuff. By the way, if you look at, take a look at that inner statue, so remember that, that photo slide I showed you, that's the guy, the same guy. Showed up at the, at the, at the beginning of my, uh, is now inside UEFN. Um, which is pretty cool, if you ask me. So it's all cool, but you can't just go around importing all the assets that you fancy into UEFN because there, is a cert, there are certain hard limits to the project size. Now you can keep an eye on the project size by opening up the correctly named project size window which will then show you some very helpful stats. So for example, for starters, the total size of your project, like entire project size cannot exceed two gigabytes. Uh, and the total download size that your players will, will have to download cannot be more than 400, megabyte, uh, 400 megabytes. So typically the biggest contributors of size to your island when you're using photogrammetry is, is just static meshes and textures, um, which you can also play around with using the modeling tools. So in the modeling tools, you can break down the number of polygons in your meshes if the size is too big, right inside UVFN, which is a very useful uh, note to think about. So with all that out of the way, let's create a very simple gameplay. Uh, in here, I have used the gate, which is actually part of the Fortnite uh, asset. By the way, I need to mention something else about the project size earlier is assets that are part of Fortnite, that are native Fortnite assets do not contribute to the overall size of your game. So you can add as many Fortnite assets, but when you bring in your own asset, then that then contributes to your size. Sorry, I forgot to mention about that. 
So here, uh, I'm bringing in the gate, which is actually a Fortnite asset, and using the sequencer device, I then animated the gate to just get open. Uh, so it's a very simple keyframe animation. I'm just like, one keyframe to open, one keyframe to close, and it just goes boop, boop, right? And with the sequences uh, device selected, I'm adding some user options in there, which says the sequencer can only play when the prop device gets destroyed. So I'm linking the devices together. And this prop, by the way, that the lamp that you're seeing is, uh, is something that I scanned out of Abu Dhabi. Um, and, uh, and here I'm just linking, saying like, you know, this can only work. Uh, the sequencer can only play when the prop, uh, prop manipulator gets destroyed. So let's see it in action. So here you go. Uh, I am running in, trying to get into the in, in in through the gate, trying to destroy it. Doesn't get destroyed. So I'm then going in here, destroying that lamp, which has about 750 health. Uh, blam, 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 blam. Destroyed, blam. Then and then the sequencer device plays. It opens up the gate, and I'm also using the teleportation device just for kicks. So that's the blue glow that you're seeing, trying to enter that that area and it just teleports me to a, a square swimming pool area, which is another part of the island itself. So pretty cool, like, you know, very simply, you can create like something that looks very cool to what, uh, uh, or very relevant or very familiar uh, to, to you, and more importantly, also familiar to your audience. Now, if you want to learn more about how to create excellent level design using UEFN, but at the same time using your own props, uh, definitely check out this page. Uh, that's on the Epic Developer Community page, and here is the link. And there's also a QR code, uh, which will then take you to that page. Uh, so if you want to scan that, I'll just kind of leave it there for a bit. Additionally, now all the scanned assets that you are going to bring in doesn't have to be realistic looking. Uh, using Quixel Mixer, which is a free tool as part of the Epic Games ecosystem, uh, you can take creative ownership of your asset. You can paint, you can sculpt, blend, mask, uh, all using Quixel Mixer, and then bring in even a stylized asset inside UEFN. And I also want to stress again, make sure that you have the rights to the asset before you publish uh, inside UEFN, but you know, you, it's, a, it's just a rock lying around or a, or a statue that's, that's cool. So that's that kind of, that's the technical part of the, of the talk. Like, you know, that's, the, that's a very quick run through of it. Now, let's go to the next part of my talk, which is building a thesis around how you can build teams for UEFN in emerging markets. Now, this is all based on the conversations I've had with studios in emerging markets uh, who are already using UEFN. Um, and this, by any way, is not a definitive structure. Right? This is just a thesis again. Uh, but this seems to be working for, for a quite, quite a bit of people, or at least asp uh, it seems to be like an aspirational goal for a lot of people. Uh, and before I begin, I also want to touch upon something that's, uh, that's curious, which is why are studios even interested in UEFN in the first place? Now, this was an article published in the Washington Post uh, where a, a Netflix said that they, in fact, compete with Fortnite more than HBO. But why Fortnite? So when 500 million people pay attention to the founding block of the next generation of entertainment, with, over, with about 62.7% of the audience composed of Gen Z, it really is common sense to get on this platform. And this stat, by the way, was published in the Business of Apps. Uh, and there's also a new generation alpha, which is on the brink, and we're also seeing the content and consumption patterns being redefined like never before. So it's no wonder that Netflix, after almost a decade of dominance uh, in streaming, is now spawning into gaming uh, spaces. So if you open up the Netflix app, you'll start seeing games there. So in order to build a team inside UEFN, uh, you do need to address a few problems. So let's look at three problems to be specific. Problem number one, discoverability on UEFN is, is still hard. Uh, you know, game designers are very excited uh, to create experiences on UEFN, but after the island is published, getting a large audience or large reach is currently quite difficult. And reach is also difficult even if your, if, even if your island does get featured uh, in, um, in, in the Discover tab of Fortnite. Problem number two, influencers find the appeal of creating user-generated content using UEFN, 
and this also includes brands uh, who are now owning their own islands inside Fortnite. That's like Honda having their own Fortnite island. Uh, but there is also a general lack of artists, world builders, and technical artists who can actually build these islands uh, for the influencers and brands. And additionally, if you're neither an artist or a developer, um, and has never used, say, Unreal Editor or any DCC tool or digital content creation tool, uh, you might find that there is quite a bit of learning curve. And problem number three is for creating custom assets uh, in just Blender or Maya, it takes a lot of time. And if your team is just full of artists, they alone cannot create an engaging UEFN experience. Now, the assets that you're seeing on the right is from Antara, uh, which is an Indian gaming uh, or a gaming company. They have created beautiful assets using uh, using Maya and Blender, which which typically reflect India. And the video that's playing is from uh, is from Masala Games again, where they are just creating a world um, inside Unreal Engine, but using custom assets they have made. So to address these three problems. Here is the thesis. The thesis is, in order to build a UEFN experience, your team should have people who can imagine and build the universe, develop campaigns, engage and activate the community, and equally importantly, have the ability to monitor and report player engagement. So to put responsibilities in, say, buckets, uh, you need game and level designers who understand the Fortnite audience and design experiences that, that provide that built-in value. Uh, the second bucket would be world builders, artists, technical artists uh, who execute the vision of these designers. Uh, this includes like 3D modelers, uh, worst script writers, uh, Niagara particle system experts, and so on. And equally importantly, you need to work with influencers and marketing folks who can build brand and campaign assets beyond just the Fortnite uh, universe, like, you know, be it on Twitch or on uh, YouTube and so on. And can, and can set up these triggers to activate the community. So based on this, based on this, uh, which is uh, with rather with that in mind, rather uh, I'm going to just do like a quick case study from a studio called Primitive in India. They are a UEFN uh, studio, and they were very kind to have shared their experience uh, in the island that they published. Now their island is called Clomboron. Now the storyline on Clomboron, I think death, math, death runs have like reached a limit in UEFN, but this was before it became all stale. Uh, but the storyline of this game essentially revolves around an escape by your character where you inadvertently steal an egg from the mother Clombo, uh, which then triggers a chase, and then uh, you have to traverse through dangerous terrain in order to escape. And the objective is to like you know run as much as you can uh, without uh, with, without getting eaten by the Clombo. So some core features of this game is that it's an endless runner. It's visually similar to the aesthetics of Fortnite, and they wanted to leverage the emotional connection that players already have with Clombo. Now again, this is not the, there is no local or culturally relevant assets here. This is more just to do a case study from an emerging market. So how did they tune Live Ops? Now UEFN experiences come with a robust analytics dashboard. So the first thing that they noticed was adding tags to their islands help a lot. Uh, their island was not featured on the Discover tab of Fortnite, but then they added tags. And as soon as they added tags, uh, the game got featured, or their island got featured in the parkour section of, uh, of, uh, of Fortnite. So lesson number one, when you're publishing your islands, make sure you add as many tags as possible uh, so that it gets featured. Lesson number two, influencer boosts help a lot. Uh, in this case, Primitive worked with an Indian uh, Fortnite influencer called Gattu. Uh, and after Gattu posted about Clomboran two times, so the first time is at the beginning of the graph, and the second time is the spike that you see. As soon as he posted, there was a spike. Like people started playing uh, and getting engaged in this, uh, in this island. So influencer marketing helps a lot. And lesson number three, if you're ever wondering if you should be making a single player game or a multiplayer game, then this is for you, because Clomboron initially had a single player mode, and then they updated their game uh, to a multiplayer build, and clearly the multiplayer had a lot more users, uh, a lot more engagement, uh, importantly, than a single player island. So to recap, simple, simple things, like this is like housekeeping stuff. When you uh, add tags to your island, when you're publishing it, uh, work with influencers and marketing very closely, and multiplayer games seem to have a lot more or better engagement than a single player island. 
So before I conclude, uh, let's go back to the beginning, which is the inspiration. Now, there are endless possibilities on how you can tell local and regional stories using UEFN and how you can structure your team to create uh, engaging fortnight experiences. UEFN is, of course, in public beta, uh, so it's important to keep yourself up to date on all the new features uh, that is being added. And the public roadmap of UEFN is now available right there. Uh, on this link, and that should help you plan your experience that you're creating on your island. Now, I'll stay on this page if you want to take a photo of this, uh, or if you want to scan that QR code. But always keep an eye on it so you can plan for your uh, for your uh, for your roadmap. And what kind of games can you make? What about a South Indian horror game? I'm from South India, so it's like South Indian horror games. That's pretty cool. Uh, or a Rajput era stealth game with detective elements. Sure, you can do that. Or how about an Arabian action adventure using traditional puppetry as a storytelling device? Or a Maasai, which is a, a tribe in, uh, in, in Africa, uh, or Kenya, or Tanzania, uh, uh, or a Maasai exploration game with, uh, say, rhythm elements. Or maybe a platformer game around the pyramids. Possibilities are quite endless, uh, and it's also very, very exciting. So I want to profusely thank all of these studios uh, who have been instrumental in providing a lot of valuable feedback based on their own UEFN experience. We have uh, Primitive, Antara, Masala Games, and Cashy Sports from India, uh, UGC90 from Turkey, PropVR from Canada, India, and the Middle East, uh, and uh, Cleverine Studio from Cambodia. So I want to thank all of these studios, and I also want to thank all of you. And I hope this talk inspire, inspired you to create culturally relevant games inside UEFN. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And I think we have a few uh, minutes for questions, if you have any questions. Uh, I think there should be like a mic there, or here, right there. If you have any questions, yeah, go for it. If there are no questions, then I was so crystal clear. Ah, I was not crystal clear. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Arun. Yeah. great. Yeah.